All right, so we are still talking about inverse trig functions. Um, again, we did the definition of inverse, the derivative of inverse sine, but I am going to do just a brief review of the general idea. Remember that the idea for inverse function, uh, for a function to have an inverse, it has to be one to one, meaning it has to pass the horizontal line test, which none of the trig functions do because they're periodic, right? They repeat themselves over and over again. So to be able to discuss inverse of trig, what we do is restrict the domain and we only look at a piece of the trig function. So for sine, we just look at this piece. And by doing that, we can see all the behavior. We see all the y values that sine will ever hit, right? But if we just focus on that piece and ignore the rest of it, then it is a one-to-one -one function, right? So we restrict the domain for sine to be between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. The other thing to remember is that with a normal trig function, you input an angle and the output is a ratio, right? So it's like opposite over hypotenuse which is just some value, meaning like it's, a, it's a, a number. So that means for inverse trig, the inputs and outputs are swapped. You're inputting a value and the output is gonna be some angle corresponding to that value, right? All right. So once we know that, we can find the derivative of inverse sine. And the way we did that, I'll just real quickly go through it. I said, I'm gonna define y as inverse sine of x. Okay, so I would like to figure out what y prime is. All right, well, if y equals inverse sine of x, Notice that y is an angle. And x is a value, right? That means that I could say that sine of y equivalently must equal x, right? Because sine is the inverse, so it's going to swap the input and the output. All right, well, then I could differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to x, so d dx. All right, well, that means we're doing some implicit differentiation. So I'm just going to change sine of y to being sine of f of x. All right, on the left-hand side, we have a composite function in the chat. What's the derivative of the outside function? Good, cosine. And I'm going to write cosine of what? f of x. And then to complete the chain rule times, you got it, Maisie. You're on top of it. f prime. And then what's the derivative of the right hand side? What's the derivative of x? That's just one. So now if I put everything back in terms of y, I have cosine y times y prime equals one. Remember that what I would like to find is y prime. So I'll just isolate y prime, y prime times one over cosine of y. But my original function was only defined in terms of x. So my derivative should also be defined in terms of x which means I'd like to somehow convert this derivative to only be a, a function of x. Well, what shapes do trig come from? How, how, do, how is trig developed? I'll give you a hint by the Greeks based on what specific shape? What specific kind of triangle? Even more specific. It's a specific subset of triangles, bam. Right triangles, it's ratios 
of sides of right triangles, right? So remember in the beginning, I labeled that Y has to be an angle, correct? All right, so then I should be able to draw a right triangle. And I'll let Y just be an acute angle in that triangle. And based on this equation, sine of y equals x, I should be able to fill in the sines, the sides of that triangle. So it's easier if we write sine y equals x over 1, right? Because now we have it as a ratio. And we know that sine is opposite over hypotenuse, which means the side opposite y has to be x. The hypotenuse is 1 right and what famous theorem can i use to come up with an expression to represent that third side of a right triangle crazy guy worship numbers burned one of his followers alive on a ship pythag so all i'll do i'll call this side b we'll go okay well b squared plus x squared equals 1 squared, and then we'll just solve for b. So b squared is just 1 minus x squared, and then b is root 1 minus x squared. So the expression for that other side is 1 minus x squared. Great. And now we'll go back to my derivative. The answer to my derivative is just 1 over cosine. 1 over cosine is the same as secant of y, right? The ratio for cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So the ratio for secant would be the reciprocal of that. So hypotenuse over adjacent. So for y, hypotenuse over adjacent. 1 over root 1 minus x squared. There is our derivative of inverse sine. All right, so if I pull back up our notes. That's what we get. The derivative of inverse sine is 1 over root 1 minus x squared, right? All right, so hopefully you have those notes. What I want you to do, and the only way you're going to get good at this. Okay, actually, let's do an example together before I have you do this. So now we know the derivative of inverse sine. Let's find. It says find the domain of f. And then find the derivative of this function. So if we're going to find the domain of f, let's first look at what the domain of just inverse sine is. So remember that the domain, if we want to talk about inverse functions, we reduce for y equals sine x. We restrict the domain to just be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, right? And then the range of sine is, is from negative 1 to 1. But if we then talk about the inverse sine of x, the domain and ranges are going to be swapped, right? So the domain is going to be from negative 1 to 1, and the range is going to be from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. And so it might be tempting to say, okay, well, what we're talking about is inverse sine here, so the domain must just be negative 1 to 1. But that's not true because this isn't just inverse sine, right? We have a sort of a transformation here. Our input is no longer just x. Our input is x squared minus 1. So the way you can then find the new domain is you're just going to set the input, 
x squared minus 1 into the restrictions of the original domain when the input is just x, meaning the original domain is between negative 1 and 1. In this case, my input is not just x, it's this. So I'm going to set that to be between negative 1 and positive 1, like this. So all we're saying is that this input, this new input, has to be in between negative and positive. Whoa. I saw Ian's eyes and I was like, is that that crazy? But then I realized I put them on the wrong side. Negative one and positive one. There we go. So all we're saying is that our input still has to be between negative and positive one. And all we want to do in this case now is just solve for x. And whatever the restrictions become once we isolate x, that's our new domain, right? So if I want to isolate x in this case, I'm just going to add 1 to every side. That's going to give me x squared is less than 2, is less than or equal to 0, right? And then I'll just take the square root of, of everything. And I'll just say that that means that x has to be between 0 and root 2. Right? So for part A, the domain is from 0 to root 2. All right. So for part B, now we're just straight up finding the derivative. I will remind you of the formula for the derivative of inverse sine. The thing we just developed was that the derivative of inverse sine is one over root one minus x squared, right? Except, again, the thing that we are dealing with is ju not just inverse sine. It's inverse sine of x squared minus 1. So what rule will we need to be using when we're taking the derivative of this situation? Chain rule? Yeah, that's what's up, Ian. Thank you. Good. It's a composite function, right? The outer function is inverse sine, and the inner function is x squared minus 1, so we do need to use chain rule. So chain rule is going to say the derivative of the outer function first. So I'm just going to write f prime of x. Now the outer function is inverse sine, so we have that derivative up there. So it's going to be 1 over root 1 minus, but instead of x in the chain rule, wherever there was an x, you replace it with your inverse function. So what's going right here? Not, did I say inverse function? I'm so sorry. I, I meant you replace x with your inside function, right? It's derivative of the outside but keep the inside in place of x. So just x squared minus 1? Yes. And then we want to multiply by the derivative of that inside function. So I'll multiply by the derivative of x squared minus 1. So I'm not doing it all in one step. All right, so f prime equals 1 over root 1 minus x squared minus 1 squared times the derivative of x squared is 2x and the derivative of 1 is 0. So it's times 2x. All right, so this can be simplified a little bit. I'm going to clean it up. When you multiply by the 2x, you can just put 2x in the numerator. Down here, 
I would have one minus, if I multiply out x squared minus one squared, that's this. So that's x to the fourth minus two x squared plus one, right? So one minus x to the fourth minus two x squared plus one. Well, the one, this one is going to cancel with this one and everything in the parentheses gets negated. So 2x over root positive 2x squared minus 4x. All right. Just for the sake of practice, I'm going to take this oh, minus 4x. Sorry, minus. What am I doing? Not minus 4x, minus x to the fourth. All right, we'll notice that in that denominator, you can factor out an x squared. So I have x squared times two minus x squared. The square root of x squared is just x. So I can pull an x out of there. And blam, blam, f prime of x equals 2 over root 2 minus x squared. All right, so a lot of algebra on that one. All right, I haven't looked up from my iPad for a while, so let me do that. If you have questions, please ask. All right, so first thing I want to do is let's just define inverse cosine because it's a wave function as well. So it's not one to one, so we can't have an inverse function unless we restrict its domain. And so I said, we kind of arbitrarily decide to restrict its domain near the origin just because that's easiest. You could literally restrict it at any point, and as long as it's one to one on that restriction, you could find its inverse, but just for, I don't know, simplicity's sake, we do it as close to the origin as possible. Well, cosine is just a shifted version of sine, right? So we want to make sure that it hits all of its y values between 1 and negative 1. Remember, cosine starts at its amplitude. So we can't really restrict it in the same place. So instead, we restrict it to be between 0 and pi. Um, in a normal year, I'd be like, yeah, you just have to have that memorized. Again, you're going to be taking this exam remotely, so you're going to have all the notes you need. But it's, it's always good to have some simple things memorized just so that you can not, it's going to be, it's going to be a time test. So you just want to be able to not have to look things up if necessary. All right. So once we restricted it, we can now define inverse cosine. Right? And we can now find the derivative of inverse cosine. So what I want you to do, I'm gonna break you out into groups, but I'm gonna give you the first step once again. All right, so let's let y equal inverse cosine x. And so what I want you to find me is the derivative of that. So d dx, of inverse cosine x equals. And the first thing you're gonna do is avoid dealing with inverse trig. But before I do that, let's remember, in this case, y is an angle, x is a value, right? And so the first thing I want to do after that is rewrite this in just regular trig form. Okay, so what would this look like using just regular trig, just regular cosine? What would the equation become if I rewrote it using cosine instead of inverse cosine? Cosine y equals x, perfect. 
So now we're off to the races. What I would like you to do then is take the derivative of this. Isolate y prime. Once you do that, you're going to have y prime equals something that involves y instead of x. Build your triangle like we did in finding the derivative of inverse sine and get it back to terms of x. So I'm going to break you back out into groups. I'll give you about three or four minutes. And then we'll do it. Come back together. So if you're watching this on video, just pause it and look at my work because I forgot to hit record until now. All right. The more you do, I'm going to have you do one more. We're going to barrel through this tangent. So let's do that real quick. But before we do that, I do think I have an... Mm -mm. Okay, tangent. Tangent is also periodic. Now, it's not a wave function like the others are, right? Sine and cosine are just continuous waves. Tangent is not continuous over all real numbers. It has these vertical asymptotes. But it is still periodic, meaning it does just repeat itself over and over again, right? It does, it would go like this. So it still doesn't pass that horizontal line test, and we still need to restrict its domain. So again, just for convenience, we go ahead and do that as close to the origin as possible. And the best place for that to happen is between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, which are the vertical asymptotes for tangent that surround the origin. So remember that when you look at an inverse function, what it's going to do is swap x and y. And so it's going to swap the domain and range. So for tangent, the domain, when we restrict it, is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. That means for inverse tangent, the range is going to be restricted there. And those vertical asymptotes become horizontal asymptotes. And so we end up looking something like this. All right, just go ahead and give me a green check to let me know when you're good with that page. So for tangent, once we've restricted the domain, you can see on mine, now it'll pass that horizontal line test, meaning any horizontal line is only going to hit that graph once. I'm sorry, I guess the original once. And therefore, we can define that inverse function. So now we should be able to find its derivative, right? So let's do that in the same exact way. So we're going to let y equal... So y equals inverse tangent. And what I would like you to do is find me the derivative of that. OK, and let's keep in mind what's going on here. For a normal trig function, the input is an angle and the output is a value. But for in, inverse functions, that's reversed. So the input here is a value, and y represents an angle. So before we take the derivative, I want to rewrite this 
in its corresponding original trig function form. So in the chat, what's the corresponding original trig function form of this equation? No, I'm not, you're, you're thinking, you're already doing calculus. I'm just, you see what you wrote above there, Maisie? I'm just looking for a situation like that. So if I wrote this so that it was an equation, there we go, involving tangent instead of inverse tan. Basically, what you can, the way you can think about this is if I took tangent on both sides of the equation, I would end up with tangent y and then tangent of inverse tangent, they would undo each other and just leave me with x on the right hand side, right? And so now I'm kind of sidestepping having to deal with any of the inverse stuff. And I'm just going to take the derivative. And I recognize, okay, well, this is implicit differentiation. So I want to think of this as tangent of f of x. Now we have a composite function. We want to make sure we're using the chain rule. Now I'm ready for you, Maisie. What's the derivative of the outside function? There we go. Derivative of tangent is just secant squared. But what should I leave as my input there? Yeah, f of x or y. And then times to finish off that chain rule, the derivative of the inside is f prime equals 1, because the derivative of x is just 1. Great. So that's secant squared y times y prime is 1. So isolating y prime, you get y prime equals 1 over secant squared y. Now, secant is the reciprocal of what function? What trig function is secant the reciprocal for? Cosine. So I can actually rewrite this as y prime equals cosine squared y. But still, we want to put this back in terms of x. So we're going to go back to building our triangle. Remember that y is an angle. And we're going to use that original tangent equation. So tangent y equals x, but I'm going to put, I'm going to write it as x over 1 to make it a ratio. We're going to go, okay, what's tangent in terms of trig? It's opposite over adjacent. So opposite y is x. Adjacent to y is 1. And in this case, I'm actually solving for the hypotenuse. So I'm going to call that c. We can say that c squared equals 1 squared plus x squared. So c squared equals 1 plus x squared. So c is root 1 plus x squared. Right? And remember that cosine squared really just means cosine times cosine. And so the ratio for cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So adjacent hypotenuse. So really what I have is 1 over root 1 plus x squared times 1 over root 1 plus x squared. But when you multiply a square root by itself, that's essentially squaring the square root, which just is going to eliminate the square root, right? So the derivative of inverse tan is just 1 over 1 plus x squared. All right, so now we have by hand differentiated all three of the big three inverse trig functions. You can actually do the derivatives of the inverse trig reciprocal functions as well that way. So like inverse cosecant, inverse secant, and inverse cotangent. Those will not come up as much. 
specifically for the AP exam. So I do recommend memorizing these first three. They'll come up relatively often. Um, the others are technically in play, but if you just have a table of them, like I said, you're going to be taking this remotely. So if you have a table of them that's easily accessible, you're going to be fine. All right. Other important things to note. are for inverse tan, because those vertical asymptotes become horizontal asymptotes, our limits at infinity have values, right? So as we approach negative infinity, our y values approach negative pi over two. As we approach positive infinity, our y values approach positive pi over two. And again, if, if we look at my the graph that I drew, oh no, it erased it. Anyways, this is the graph of inverse tan. As we go off to positive infinity, our y values are getting closer and closer to that horizontal asymptote at pi over two and negative pi over two for negative infinity. All right, so just important to know that. Um, I just wanna do one more example. Tomorrow as a warm up, maybe we'll do this example. So to, or Wednesday, we're gonna do just a couple of warm up problems. And then, like I said, it's just going to be problem sets. They're going to be Khan Academy assignments for 3.5 and 3.6. So I'm just going to have you working on those. Um, I'll break you out just so that it's smaller groups. You can jump back into the main room if you want to ask questions or go, or go over something. Um, but I just want to do one quick example like this. This isn't a calculus example. This is algebra or pre-calculus. But I just want to talk about how to attack something like this and why it's so important to understand that inverse functions reverse the relationship between input and output. And when you're dealing with trig, it's important to understand regular trig has an input of an angle and the output of a ratio, whereas inverse trig has an input of a value and an output of an angle, right? So if we want to evaluate something like this, we can to not involve trig. And it's very similar to what we did in the last couple problems. And the way you want to do it is by working your way from the inside to the outside. Here I have inverse tangent. What sort of an output will inverse tangent give me? Does it give me an output that is a value or that is an angle? Right, so let's call inverse tangent of x theta. So I'm gonna say let inverse tan x equal theta. Well, I can look at that, and just like we did before, I can rewrite that as a regular trig equation by taking tangent of both sides. And that would be that x equals tangent of theta, right? And then I can put x over one, and I can build a triangle out of that. So tangent theta, that just means that this is theta. I know tangent is opposite over adjacent, so this is x, this is one. And just like the last problem, that means that I can solve for the hypotenuse using Pythag, and the hypotenuse is gonna come out to root one plus x squared, right? All right, well, since I made this equation that inverse tangent equals some value theta, those are equal to each other, I can substitute theta for inverse tangent. So really what I'm looking for is cosine of theta, right? Because I let theta equal inverse tangent. So all I did was just, since those are equal, replaced inverse tangent with cosine theta. Well, since I built a triangle, that satisfies this inverse tangent, I can use that tri triangle to evaluate cosine of theta. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So that's just one over root one plus x squared. And there we go, I did it. This simplifies to one over root one plus x squared. Right, so there may be some problems like that. We were kind of doing that implicitly within finding the derivatives of our inverse trig functions, but I just wanted to show you one explicit example.
of that. So you can go back and watch this if I went a little fast there. I just didn't want to keep you after. All right. So 